children, you can be dismissed for Sundays, for children's church. The children get to go sing more songs. You're all stuck with me. Acts chapter 1 is where we'll be this morning. Acts chapter 1, please. Let me break it into the context a little bit, so I'll uh, kind of set the scene. Tony, if you're going live, I uh, appreciate that. <laughs> Two minutes. Well, 30 seconds. 30 seconds of going. 30, he's going to go live, folks. So if you have a faith, if you're right. if, you uh, so, if you're big on social media, <coughs> we do have a, our uh, church has a, a Facebook page. A, um, I believe they also have a Twitter, I believe we also have a Twitter page. And we also have a YouTube page. I believe it's all under the auspice of Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. If you look for that on your the hand uh, the appropriate handle, you will uh, you will find that there. So if you so if you prefer if you if you're uh, active on the social media, you can uh, do that. Um, we're gonna be in Acts chapter one. I'm gonna set the scene here for you. So Jesus Christ just rose, just ascended into heaven, and after that. The remaining, the remaining disciples, now apostles, are going to be in a kind of like a, 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 a I wouldn't I wouldn't use the word weird, but certainly different scene. Christ has just arisen, Christ has just ascended to heaven, and now they're going to be this is going to be the true the the, the true start. Of what what is commonly referred to as the the church age, the the age in which we are in currently, or dispensation, perhaps if you want to even use that word. I know, Brother Charlie, that's a uh, subtle plug for our Sunday school series on dispensations. But the the apostles are going to be launching what Christ originally established in Matthew 16 when he said, "I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it." So, a context starts in verse 15. So, I'm going to start reading in verse 15, but I'm focusing on verses 23 through 26. That's where we're going to get my That's where we're going to at least start to look into the series, uh, into our message this morning. I've entitled this message, The History of Casting Lots. The History of Casting Lots. And I want to see just what lots, just why lots were cast. And more importantly, why we don't cast them today. Verse 15, the Bible says, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, parentheses, the number of names together were about 120, end of parentheses, Men and brethren, the scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us, and have obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. That's lovely. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as that field is called in their proper tongue, Selma, that is to say, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. Wherefore all the... All, wherefore of these men, which had company with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John, unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Verse 23. And they appointed two. Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to look into your word this morning. Lord, I just pray you would help all of us Speak to our hearts. 
Lord, help us to learn how the history of lot casting is was utilized in its day. But Lord, help us to see more importantly the avenue, the new avenue, which would come about, which leads us to believe that we no longer need to cast lots. And Lord, if there is somebody here this morning that isn't saved, I pray you would speak to them. Convince them of their need to be saved. Uh, but Lord, for the rest of us, encourage us and challenge us from thy word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to be preaching mostly from my uh, from my notes. So, um, if you perhaps if you've never heard me, um, I generally put out, I usually either have a notebook or a couple pages in which I'll usually read off, kind of almost like a teleprompter, but then occasionally I'll just kind of walk back and forth just to think I know, I actually know what I'm talking about. Um, so the disciples had narrowed a list down to two men who were, now these men, of course, in order to be an apostle, the qualification was that one must be a, must have witnessed the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. There were 11 apostles left. Of course, there were originally 12 disciples. Judas had erred and sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. And when he recognized what he'd done, tried to undo the deed. When he couldn't undo it, he went and hung himself. So now, so there were 11 disciples at this point gathered. They were in a room together with, a, with other people. To total this room, 120, this would be commonly referred to, this is not the upper room meeting, but this is definitely, but there are 120 men gathered, presumably perhaps right after the ascension. And now, the, now they're going to bring two men before them, and they're going to, and they're going to, and they're going to pray. Both men are mentioned just twice in all of Scripture. Barsabas, which is mentioned twice, our text, our text here, and Acts fifteen twenty two. We're not going to turn there. And Matthias again mentioned to us twice, but both of which are going to take place in verses twenty three through twenty six. The Bible says that they prayed and then cast lots. The lot fell upon Matthias, and so he was chosen to replace Judas as his twelfth apostle. Now, despite the fact that he's only his name only appears twice in Scripture, doesn't necessarily mean he wasn't important, but it might have meant that he just had a quiet ministry, and he was used in some avenue. Anyway, the disciples here used what I, I guess I would say the word unorthodox. They used a an unorthodox method to determine the will of God. They indeed prayed, but then they cast lots. This brings to mind the question, where are our lots today? Why do we not cast lots before the Lord today? Well, let's, let's, uh, let's see what the Lord would have us in store to believe when it comes to the avenue of casting lots. Let's, more, let's learn more about these lots first. There are approximately 80 to 90 references. They're mostly repetitious to the biblical term Lot. And this is not to be confused with the biblical character Lot, who, because he pitched toward tent towards Sodom, got in a lot of trouble. Uh -huh. <laughs> Let's turn in our Bibles to Leviticus 16, 7 through 10. So we're going to be doing a little bit of, of uh, scripture turning. Got a, quite a few passages we're going to look into, but I want to start with Leviticus 16. I'm going to start reading verse 7. The Bible says, And he, that's going to be referring to Aaron, shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. This is one of the earliest such examples of the um, casting of lots in Scripture. This is the one of the major feast days to the Lord, commonly referred to as the Day of Atonement. Here, God has asked Aaron, the high priest, to cast two lots upon the two goats presented. One to have one is to have the Lord's lot, 
and the other was to have the scapegoat lot. The goat that had the Lord's lot was to be slain for the sins of the Israelites, but the other goat was to be presented alive to God and then let free. This is a great symbol as a picture of our sins when we accepted Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. Whereas the Bible says in Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. But here we get a, this is just the beginning of an idea of how the lot was used here. God chose which goat was to be sacrificed here. And of course in our text, he chose which apostle was to replace Judas, was to become the 12th apostle. In Numbers chapter 26, that's our next re uh, reference that we would like to turn to this morning. Numbers 26, I'm going to be reading verses 55 and 56. Give everybody a chance to turn there real quick. This is going to be the um, dividing the land. Numbers 26. Numbers 26. And I'm going to be reading verses 55 and 56. This is going to be the dividing up of the promised land as given unto Moses. I'm going to start reading actually in verse 52 for context, beg my pardon. Verse 52 to start. Numbers 26. The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Unto these the land shall be divided for an inheritance according to the number of names. To many thou shalt give the more inheritance, and to few thou shalt give the less inheritance. To every one shall his inheritance be given according to those that were numbered of him. Verse 55. Notwithstanding, the land shall be divided by lot. According to the names of the tribes of their fathers shall, they shall inherit. According to the lot shall the possession thereof be divided between many and few. Now, of course, Moses is not going to divvy up the land, but rather his successor, Joshua, and that the land was going to be subdivided according to Lot. Not the biblical character Lot, but by how the Lot is going, how God is going to cast the Lot. Now, while men can see this perhaps as a game of chance, and I'm going to use that term in air quotation marks, God knew specifically what he was doing and supernaturally allowed it so each lot fell to the tribe that was to get that specific portion of the land. Moses did divide up the portions east of the Jordan to satisfy two and a half of the tribes. Also remember that the tribe of Levi had no inheritance because they were serving as priests to each of the tribes. Joshua would later execute the Lord's will to divide up the land by lot, beginning in Joshua chapter 13 and running through Joshua chapter 21. Let's see one such example of this, and let's turn to Joshua chapter 18. In Joshua chapter 18, we'll see one such example of how the lot was going to be divided up. I'll begin reading in verse number 6. Here the Bible says, Ye shall therefore describe the land into seven parts, and bring the description hither to me, that I may cast lots for you here before the Lord our God. But the Levites have no part among you, for the priesthood of the Lord is their inheritance. And Gad and Reuben and half the tribe of Manasseh, the two and a half tribes, have received their inheritance beyond Jordan on the east, which Moses the servant of the Lord gave them. That was our reference to Numbers 26 right there. Verse 8. And the men arose and went away. And Joshua charged them that went to describe the land, saying, Go and walk through the land, and describe it, and come again to me, that I may here cast lots for you before the Lord in Shiloh. And the men went and passed through the land, and described it by cities in the seven parts in a book, and came again to Joshua to the host at Shiloh. And Joshua cast lots for them in Shiloh before the Lord, and there Joshua divided the land unto the children of Israel according to their divisions. 
And the lot of the tribe of the children of Benjamin came up according to their families, and the coast of their lot came forth between the children of Judah and the children of Joseph. We'll stop there. Because in the further verses, he's going to give the borders for the, for, that, for the tribe of Benjamin, and he gives the, the borders for all the other tribes as well in the following verses and the following chapters. The remainder of the tribes would now have lots cast before the Lord to determine which plot of the land they would get. Only a side note here, it's interesting that Joshua, who was one of the faithful, who was one of the faithful spies who spotted out the promise, who was asked to spot out the promised land, is now asking men to spot out specific areas and bring a description to him that he would cast that he would cast lots before the Lord. Just an interesting side note. The remainder of the tribes would have lots cast before God to determine which plot of the land they would get. No doubt, size and loyalty to God's word also had a hand in God determining which tribe deserved which portion of the land they would be given. Now, so we see, so we see here first that the we see we've seen the early examples of how lots were used. We saw how lots were used to determine to uh, to. In the uh, the Day of Atonement, one goat was to uh, be slain for the for the Israelites, and one was to be presented as a scapegoat. We saw how the how God was going to divide the Promised Land by lot, as He first promised to Moses, and then executed through Joshua. Now I'd like to see Lot determining the guiltiness of a person, and I'd like to turn to First Samuel fourteen. 1 Samuel 14, we're going to be breaking into the context, so I'm going to set the scene real quick while everyone turns there. Jonathan, the, Saul, the son of Saul, is going to be in a battle with the Philistines, and this is going to be quite the battle. This battle is such that Saul had set a command to not eat until they had won. But... Jonathan is going to allow the tribe is going to allow the men to take to take some portions, and so when Saul hears of this, he get he gets pretty wrath. Verse forty-one. It's First Samuel fourteen. Sorry, verse thirty-nine to start. For as the Lord liveth, which saveth Israel, though it be in my Jonathan, in Jonathan my son, he shall surely die. But there was not a man among all the people that answered him. Then said he unto all Israel, Be ye on one side, and I and Jonathan my son will be on the other side. And the people said unto Saul, Do what seemeth good unto thee. Therefore Saul said unto the Lord God of Israel, Give a perfect lot. And Saul and Jonathan were taken, but the people escaped. Verse 42. And Saul said, Cast lots between my, me and Jonathan my son. And Jonathan was taken. Then Saul said to Jonathan, Tell me what thou hast done. And Jonathan told him and said, I did but taste a little honey with the end of the rod that was in mine hand, and lo, I must die. We'll stop right there for now. The scene here is that Jonathan Saul, uh, Jonathan's son, uh, jo <laughs> sorry, Saul's son Jonathan, is going to be in a fierce battle with the Philistines. The cavalry had been charged by Saul to not eat until they had won. That's going to be found in verse 24. Battles like this could have taken quite a long time to prevail. So this might have been quite the quite a bad request on the part on the on uh, on part of Saul but nevertheless Saul had said it and so that was to given to be the rule here however Jonathan was not aware of the charge and so he ate of the honey in verse 27 when word got to Saul of the feast the cavalry had who apparently had eaten of cattle with blood he called for all them all to stand before him eating was not a sin but rather is because they disobeyed the charge of Saul and they also ate blood, which was forbidden the laws given to them in the book of Leviticus. He first cast lots between him with Jonathan and the people. The people had one lot, 
Saul and Jonathan had the other lot. They got the Lord's lot. So now again, so Saul said, okay, separate myself from my son. One lot was going to be for Jonathan, and one lot was going to be for him. The lot would fall to Jonathan. Jonathan would confess to the act, as we saw in verse number 44. Sorry, 43. Verse 44. And Saul answered, God do so and more also, for thou shalt surely die, Jonathan. 45. And the people said unto Saul, Shall Jonathan die who hath wrought this great salvation in Israel? God forbid, as the Lord liveth, there shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground, for he hath wrought with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan, that he died not. Then Saul went up from following the Philistines, and the Philistines went to their own place. We'll stop right there. The people here vouch for Jonathan, and so he was spared. The lot was, deter the lot was used here to determine God's will. But yet in this case, we still see that God so moved in the hearts of the people that they, that they persuaded Saul to not slay Jonathan. When Israel returned to the land after the Babylonian Persian captivity, they cast lots. Let's see one such example in Nehemiah chapter 10. Nehemiah 10, and I'd like to look at verse number 34 in particular. As the Bible says, And we cast the lots among the priests, the Levites and the people, for the wood offering to bring it into the house of our God, after the houses of our fathers, at times appointed year by year, to burn upon the altar of the Lord our God, as it is written in the law, and to bring our first fruits of our ground, and the first fruits of all fruit of all trees year by year under the house of the Lord. So this was just another example of the cast of cat of how lots were cast in Scripture. In Proverbs 16:33, this is a passage we will want to turn to. Sixteen thirty-three. Here Solomon says, The lot is cast into the lap. But the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. When an important decision needed to be made in the Old Testament, the Lord allowed the usage of the lot to be the determiner of his will. In Proverbs 18.18, 18, the Bible says, The lot caused the contention to cease and parteth between the mighty. There was, to be no need, there was no need for arguing, because the lot determined God's will every time. So it was used for good, and God gave his okay for usage of such a tool, such a way, a method of determining his will. Of course, now keep in mind too, all of our references so far have been in the Old Testament. We will get to the New Testament in just a little bit. Here is a way God used a lot to change someone's direction. We saw how God used a lot to, deter to determine which goat was going to be taken in the Day of Atonement. We saw how God used the lot to supernaturally divide up the promised land. We've seen how a lot determined a person's guiltiness. We're going to see how the lot is going to be used to change someone's direction. Turn with me to Jonah chapter 1. Lot's going to be used here to change someone's direction. Jonah chapter 1. I trust all of us are familiar with the account of Jonah, so let's go on to verse 7. Here Jonah's on the ship, and there's a tumultuous storm in the midst of the, of the great sea Mediterranean. Verse 7. And they said, everyone to his fellow, that would be the men that were on the ship that Jonah was aboard and fast asleep on, come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. We see the men on the storm-riddled ship to Tarshish, figuring out why all of a sudden there was this raging storm that had endured like never before. Now, mind you, 
These are men who have probably been through some great storms. There are doubt, no doubts of great storms on the Mediterranean Sea. But this storm that God had whipped up was supernatural, and in such a way was the perfect storm that even these weathered men who had practically probably been through about anything and above all what normal people would see was such that they had to know that this was something different than anything else. <laughs> it reminded it reminds me, I'm, I grew up kind of a, a weather geek, a meteorologist wannabe. <coughs> and in 1991, there's an event commonly referred to as the perfect storm. This is a, a, a meteorological phenomenon that occurred off the coast of New England and the coast of Nova Scotia. A ship named the Andrea Gale and its crew were attempting to return after a, fix, a fishing expedition in the Western Atlantic, and they were attempting to return to, to, uh, to Massachusetts. They, after, but seeing this storm, they, they were still deciding they still wanted to go home, probably because of lack of provisions, or lack of time that they would have had to try and take another route. In so doing, this storm, unfortunately, the this, this storm would cause this boat to capsize and later take, uh, and later, uh, and none of the, no, and nobody survived, unfortunately. But the point was that even these men, as expert as they were, and as, and as having probably ridden hundreds of other storms had decided to take their, had decided to go through and endure this storm. Unfortunately, they could not endure this one. This storm was, a, this storm here that the, that, were, that the sailors were on the Mediterranean was a such they had never seen before. And God, God brought them to the realization that something was not right. They gathered to cast lots amidst the turbulent seas, and the lot fell upon the man who was sleeping, the prophet Jonah. While they may have believed they randomly selected one to be guilty, God overruled and made sure his man was the guilty party. Jonah would later confess, and Jonah would later change direction in the, midst of the, in the midst of the belly of the great fish, and would get right, and would go on to do the will of God. So we see how the lot was used to change someone's direction. Let's view one example of lots, and we're going to go to Matthew 27, 35 to see this. Perhaps maybe a lot of us are probably familiar with this account of the lot. Christ's on the cross here. Verse 35 of Matthew 27, where the Bible says, And they crucified him, and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. Here lots were used, but their usage here was not to glorify God as much as it was to fulfill an Old Testament prophecy. The usage of the lot was the gamble to determine who got the vesture of the dying Lord upon the cross. This, by the way, is one of the few events of the crucifixion hours described in all four gospel accounts. This prophecy was spoken of by David in the infamous Psalm 22. And sure enough, practically a thousand years later, the soldiers gambled for his very cloak. So all that took place chronologically before our text in Acts chapter 1. As the apostles selected two, they prayed over the, them for, to God for his will to be done and then cast lots. So why don't we cast lots today? Our answer starts with a look at John 16, 13. John chapter 16 and verse 13 Lord Jesus Christ is speaking, and he says here, Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. 
For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. Note the phrase, he will guide you into all truth. Christ was promising the Comforter, that is the Holy Spirit, to the believers after his death and resurrection. And his, and, his, and his spirit abides in each and every believer. He indwells each believer at the moment of their conversion to Christ and stays forever, convicting them of sin and teaching them how to grow as Christians. Relating back to our text, the disciples in Acts 2 would finally receive the Comforter to guide them and help them in decision making. Of course, one must still pray, but now there would no longer be the need to cast lots when deciding what God would have them to do. Let's view two examples of the Holy Spirit in action guiding believers. The first one is going to be in Acts chapter number 13, verses 1 through 3. You don't have to turn there. I will, uh, I'll read it for you. Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Give me just a second to get there. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and, Lu and, Lu and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I had called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Many believers were gathered at the church of Antioch, including this list given in verse 1. Note verse 2. What would they have done that had this occurred perhaps 50 years ago? And they needed men to go out? They would have prayed and cast in lots, but here we see that this was no longer necessary. The Holy Spirit was now guiding the believers gathered, gathered at, the, at the church in Antioch to make the call for Barnabas and Saul, who would later be called Paul, to go out from the Antioch church. Not only does this teach of the Holy Spirit's guidance in the life of, of, of the new believer, but also, as a side note, teaches that the local church should be the one sending forth God's appointed missionaries and pastors into the harvest. Another such example is Acts 16, 6 through 10. Here what we see what the Spirit does by closing some doors and opening some other ones. This would be the Macedonian call. Verse 6 of Acts 16. Now, when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost, not by lot, but forbidden by the Holy Ghost, to preach the word in Asia after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, an avenue, but the Spirit suffered them not, closing the door. And they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the, seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called for us to preach the gospel unto them. An open door. God closes the door on, two, on Paul's, ministry, Paul's possible ministry to two areas, but opens the door for the Macedonian call. As we remember from the hymn, Send the Light. We have heard the Macedonian call today, Send the Light, Send the Light. Again, had this occurred perhaps 50 years earlier, Paul would have prayed and perhaps even cast lots before the Lord between each individual land, and God would have sent Paul into southeastern Europe. Note Paul recalling the need for him to go to Macedonia and God opening that door in 2 Corinthians 2.12. However, as Wonderful as an avenue of the Holy Spirit is, we can fail to yield to the Spirit. We can fail to yield to the Spirit of God. In Ephesians 4.30, we are told we can grieve the Spirit. And when He is grieved, there can be no guidance because we are out of fellowship with Him. Answers cannot be determined as clearly because sin has clogged the conduit between us and the Holy Spirit. And until we get that right, we can, be, we can make bad decisions influenced by self and not by scripture. So what is our conclusion then today? There's no need for believers today to cast lots to determine the will, the will of God, perhaps in their lives, perhaps as a church. 
We have the Holy Spirit. He will guide us into all truth. And the avenue, and we have the great avenue of prayer. Together, that should be quite the step toward making such decision in one's life. How about wise counsel? Numerous passages in the book of Proverbs indicate that wise counsel may also help a believer make the right decision. Proverbs 15.22 is one such passage, but there are others that suggest that Christians should seek other mature Christians when it comes to a big decision. We have wise counsel, we have prayer, we have the Holy Spirit, and we have the completed and perfect Word of God. God doesn't roll dice with our lives, neither should we. There is no longer a need to cast lots. Let's close in prayer. Uh, with heads bowed and eyes closed, I know this was a message that was intended for believers to recognize just what a precious avenue the Holy Spirit was. But perhaps there is somebody who says, wait a second, I don't have the Holy Spirit. How do I know I have the Holy Spirit? I don't. I don't, I don't know if I have the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not a believer. And you need to, you need to recognize that in order to, you want to make right, we all want to make right decisions. But the, the most important right decision one could ever make is the choice to get right with God. And the choice to accept Jesus Christ and his death on the cross as the only forgiveness for sin. The challenge is to believers this morning. The challenge is not so much, we don't need to be convicted on the avenue of casting lots, but rather to be convicted about how the Holy Spirit moves in each and every one of our lives. Are we giving the Spirit full regard? Is there that true and blessed quietness in each and every one of our lives? Are we allowing Him to work in the way that He wants? That would be the challenge to each and every believer this morning. And I pray that, he, that the Holy Spirit is moving and that God's working in your life. And if he's not, why not take the time to say, Lord, I repent of my actions and that I would like, and I, and I want the Spirit, and I want your Spirit to work in my life. Help me, Lord, to make right decisions through your Holy Spirit. Help me to, to read more, to pray more, to seek your face to make the right decisions in my life. Decisions that will matter for an eternity. That would, be, that would be the invitation this morning. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to look into your word. I thank you for how you did use lots in the Old Testament, but Lord, I thank you more importantly for Jesus Christ, for his death on the cross, for that it would bring us the hope for that for that we can have Christ in each and every one of us through your avenue of the Holy Spirit. And that, Lord, use, use your spirit this morning. Use your spirit to convict us of sin. Use your spirit to help us to grow in our lives. Help us use this, av this important avenue to reach a lost and dying world. And, Lord, we'll give you all the honor and glory. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessed quietness is going to be our hymn of invitation. We don't have a hymn. That, we won't have a, a, a pianist for the uh, for the invitation, so we'll just sing a cappella. One fifty nine in your hymnals. We'll sing. We'll sing two or three verses. Just follow my lead. One fifty nine this morning. I'm actually going to turn my microphone off so that way it doesn't blast everybody's ears.